So as you all know, we will be uh, having a Q&A session now. You've all been invited here because you know, you've all been really involved in, in one way or another in different things here in Singapore. So what we're going to do is spend the next 45 minutes to hear from you, hear your thoughts on what you've just heard, perhaps share your experiences also on some of the things you are doing. We've got about 45 minutes for this Q&A and we'll try and cover as much ground as we can. When you get to the microphones, which are around the room, please just state your name, where you're coming from. Tell us a, a very quickly a bit about yourself and then address your question. And please try and keep your questions short as well. So I invite you now to start coming forward. If you want to, come and stand at the microphones and I'll take your questions quickly. But just off the top of my head, because uh, I've just heard the speech as well, and many of the things you've mentioned sound similar to our Singapore conversation back in 2013, which you also helmed. So let me just ask you, because I'm sure many people are thinking it, how is this going to be different? Well, uh, Steve, I, th I think that's a very important question. Now, our Singapore conversation, when I led it, as I said in my speech earlier, I wasn't sure you know, what it would lead to. It was a very open-ended. And part of the Singapore conversation was a conversation between the government and the people for the government to better understand the hopes and aspirations and the concerns of our people. And at the same time, it was also an excellent opportunity for our people to get to know one another better. Uh, one very, uh, my very first session, I was very struck when a young man came up to me and said, Mr. Heng, your, I signed up for this. Your team has put me in a conversation with a group of older people. I want to come and talk to young people. Can I change? And I said, no, there's a reason why we, uh, we did it that way. Please stick to your assigned table. I was very happy at the end of it, he came up to me and said, they said, hey, I'm so happy you didn't allow me to change. I said, why? They said, actually, I didn't realize that older people have such different concerns from me and my, my friends. So as a way of helping one another understand Singaporeans' concern from all uh, segments of our society, he found it extremely valuable. And in fact, I heard many of that along the way. And at the same time, it also helped us uh, to get very important inputs for our policy making, as I mentioned. So that was what the Singapore conversation uh, achieved, which I thought was very good. Now, what is different this time? As I would say there are two key differences. One is we want to create this Singapore together as a way of uh, getting Singaporeans to not just share their views, but also to do things together. Taking action, and that's why I mentioned about democracy of deeds. That it is not just what we are concerned about, what we worry about, but what can we do together? And how can you and I take action in order to do something about it? So that's the first difference. And the second difference is that beyond just an immediate issue that may concern us, I hope to get Singaporeans to think about our long-term future. Now, how can we come together to think about what will Singapore be like? What do we want Singapore to be like 10 years from now, 20 years from now? And how do we uh, help our future generation to also shape their views? What is it that we have inherited a good uh, Singapore because of the hard work of our founding generations and over the years? What is it that we can do together to live a better future for our future generation. And so it is, the time frame is somewhat different too, not just thinking about the here and now, but how do we think of Singapore in the long run? So it's a more long-term approach. I yeah. still can't So help. Both, both action and the long-term. Yeah. I guess, but yeah, we're looking at a more long-term plan in, certain, in terms of that conversation Indeed. was more for those immediate leads. Of course, I keep thinking when you, the young guy said he didn't want to be in a group with older people, you didn't tell him, this is not SDU, we're not matchmaking here, you know. He might have come he for might, that reason. Maybe. Which, uh... <laughs> Need a few friends. Okay, I'm going to go, uh, the gentleman over there, and then over there, and then the lady on the right. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Good morning. Uh, my my morning. name is Lou. I'm an active citizen from Tuapayo. Uh, I hear a few things. First one is that uh, the government really would like to have a democracy of deeds, therefore encouraging Singaporeans to take up uh, causes and champion it and do it themselves. Of course, with the support of the government, 
through ground or whatever, yeah? Uh, I want to know uh, the people here, how, is, how are they selected? Because I'd like to know, are they opposition party members who are also active citizens, have been invited here so that we have a true diversities, all right? The second thing is that uh, I think when we talk about uh, people understanding what the government is trying to do, I think we, I'm using a workers' party slogan from the past, right? A first world parliament, except that I'd like to add a few things. A first world parliament supervised by the first world citizen. So I think what we need to do is really to have just the uh, citizen taking the democracy of deed, at the same time also making sure that the government truly are listening to us and truly uh, taking care of the people who need the most right. help. All right, thank okay. you. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Maybe can I ask you, you mentioned that you are an active, uh, they are here active neighbor or something? Active citizens. You I have are... been involved with the rich, uh, rich Forum for many years. Uh -huh. I'm also a volunteer, have oh, ambassadors, volunteer provision officers. Oh. I was also involved with the citizen juries on the war on, uh, the war on diabetes, yes. Oh, well, thank you. I, I think you, you, you are a good illustration of the, what I just mentioned, which is how you know, each of us can play our part. And you, in fact, you have contributed in many, many areas. I hope it has been a, a very fulfilling experience for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, that's great. Now, so on your question about, you know, uh, will we encourage, will we work with the opposition? Well, we'll work with, as I mentioned in my speech, as long as your heart is for the good of Singapore and Singaporeans, we'll work with anyone. But let me also add that the, when we talk about diversity of views, it is not necessarily the case that there must be a diversity of views only because someone is labelled an opposition. The diversity of views uh, comes from all sources. I can tell you that even in our own cabinet meetings, the ministers often have a diversity of views. <laughs> so uh, they, it is good for us to debate all these options. But we must not have a diversity of purpose because as I said, unity is important. How we have been able to take Singapore forward all this while is that we all share a sense of common purpose. This is where we want to take Singapore, where we want to take Singaporeans. And within that, we can discuss you know, whether you have a better idea or someone else have a better idea. And if I could just jump the better in ideas win. very quickly. And just to address your question of who's here in the room, we didn't pick people uh. based on which political party they are for. <laughs> More like, how did you contribute to Singapore? So many here have been involved in different right. grassroots, different projects that have yes. contributed in their own way. Yep. So uh, I'm just going to move on. Yep. Sir, thank you, sir. Because the young man there whose T-shirt says, Pioneer Species. So pioneer species. You, uh, not Pioneer Generation, like, look too young. Yeah. <laughs> um, Go ahead. Thank you, Minister, for your wonderful speech. I think it's um, very meaningful, especially as a young person, to know that you know, there's so much effort going to build Singapore's future. So, um, my name is Carl. I'm from uh, the Global Youth Biodiversity Network and an MPAX volunteer. And recently, according to a United Nations report, we are losing a million species in the, in the coming years. And we know that this uh, biodiversity, this diversity, you know, is the insurance, against, uh, insurance for our food security against natural disasters and hazards and basically Singapore's future well-being. So, I must ask, you know, what must Singapore do to end this extinction crisis? Yeah. Well, Carl, that's a very good question. May, may I ask your T-shirt, Pioneer Species, is it a particular group? It's really cute, Pioneer Species. <laughs> um, so, I'm also from the National University of Singapore, from uh -huh. this Environmental Biology Interest Group. Oh, I so, see. we care about nature, biodiversity, and environment, not just for the animals and plants, but actually for all our well-being. Oh, I see. Oh, that, that's great. So you, you ask, what is it that uh, we, we can do? And uh, indeed, I share your concerns about the diminishing biodiversity, not just around us, you know, in the whole world. And many of our man-made actions are making things harder. One example is climate change, because with climate change, global sea temperature rises, and if it goes by a certain amount, the, the whole ecosystem can be destroyed. And so it's important for us to take action. So what is it that Singapore can do? Uh, as you know, I've announced a carbon tax in order that we do our part uh, in keeping to our Paris Agreement and we work with like-minded people. So that's first. Uh, 
Uh, second, we are doing a lot of uh, R&D work on urban solutions and sustainability. And how do we keep Singapore uh, sustainable? So on our end, a lot of end parks, for example, has done a lot of good work uh, all around the island, whether it's in planting trees, uh, looking after the, the biodiversity in our area. Uh, we even have an overhead bridge across uh, PI, PIE, uh, where it allows the animals to cross from one part to another. But beyond what Singapore itself can do, uh, this is a global ecosystem, and the whole world must work together on this. And that is why we are looking for, you know, working together with like-minded countries, making sure that the whole world sticks to this uh, our Paris Agreement, and the whole world takes action. The, in fact, the World Wildlife Fund, World, World Wildlife Fund, actually, actually based in Singapore. And there are many such bodies that we can work together with them. And also we are working with the World Bank, which has a mission of reducing poverty, which has a mission of promoting the, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Just a few, last week I was speaking to Mr. Ban Ki-moon, who was the UN SecGen when SDG was first articulated. And he explained to me the great complication of bringing about the SDG. So bringing it itself was hard, but now getting people to observe it and to realize it is even harder. But I think where we can find good partnerships, we'll be happy to work together with other governments, with NGOs, with university students. And we ourselves must do our part. And Minister Masagos, for example, have talked about how we can make Singapore more sustainable. Uh, going for zero waste, right. and he'll be speaking on this soon. So, so it's definitely on the radar. That's it's what on you're the radar. Saying. And to address your but concerns. But I'm very, good to, very glad to hear how our young people are so passionate about this. And I think that's what the government is looking for. More, more people like you guys to step forward with ideas and initiatives yeah. that allow for collaboration, yes. if I'm not wrong. Thank okay? you, Minister. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Jillian. Good morning. Uh, um, let me say how delighted I am to be here today, recognizing you, Mr. Heng, as the epitome of resilience, you've bounced back from adversity, and it sounds like you've come back with greater vigor and determination to serve and lead the country, so congratulations. My question relates to the first point of your four-point agenda for the conversations that you and the 4G leadership would like to have. It relates to the point that you mentioned. Singapore finds itself in uh, a shifting global shifting geopolitical mm -hmm. landscape. As a little red dot, this really matters very much to us. DPM, as someone who's traveled extensively recently, but more importantly, as someone who has been at the side of the master of statecraft, our founding Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew, mm -hmm. what would you say to these two questions? First, <laughs> through the past months, what is the most critical reflection that you've gathered from your interactions with foreign parties, foreign powers, that you want us to understand better? Then secondly, what would you therefore like citizens to understand better? Perhaps they've misperceived something or misunderstood. What would you like citizens to understand better so that Singapore, Team Singapore, as you said, can, lead, can succeed uh, and thrive in a changing world, changing geopolitics, and really changing structure of the global economy, changing region as well. So thank you for that. Uh, yeah, well, thank you. to ask the question. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jilin. First, uh, thank you for, uh, you know, I, I, I've been very, very fortunate and very blessed to, uh, uh, to have recovered. Now, um, on your two questions, first, what is it that... Uh, our, my reflections on what is happening. I'll say that it is, it is an ex extremely uh, delicate as well as complicated situation because essentially the, there's a very uncomfortable adjustment between the US and, and China because as each US has been the superpower all these years and China is growing very quickly. And in that process, there can be a lot of uh, misunderstanding. Uh, for example, on the economic development, you know, what kind of economic model are you using? And what is it that 
the uh, what is it that you know each party should do to adjust to this. But the lesson for us is that I don't think you know every country in the world, every government in the world, must want a better life for their people, and therefore the existing value chain in the global economy cannot stay the same. Those at the bottom of the value chain must want to move up the value chain and have a better life for their people. And those of us who are further ahead must run faster, make better use of science, technology and innovation to create new sources of growth. Otherwise, by seeking to just remain dominant where we are, it means that others do not have room to grow. So it is very important for us to work closely with all our partners that, and understand that as the world changes, we must change. Yeah. So in our relationship, for example, with our ASEAN neighbours, we've been working very closely together to see how we can accelerate ASEAN integration, and not just ASEAN, but ASEAN China, ASEAN India, ASEAN Japan. So in my recent trips uh, to uh, China and Japan, I've discussed on how we can work together as all parties adjust to this growth. And also to promote better people-to-people -people exchanges, to promote better understanding, and to make sure that our coverage of what is happening not, do not look at just our own perspective, but from the perspectives of the other countries. Is that, is uh, that also what, a second, what you think Singaporeans need to know more about? Is that key to what we need to understand better? Indeed. So the, your, to the second question is, what can, we, what can Singaporeans do? Which is that we need to understand that these are global forces that are shaping these global dynamics. And we are a, a little nation, but it, we are not without strength. In fact, if we can pull our diverse strengths together, we can interact with many parts of the world. And which is why I mentioned in my speech that actually Singaporeans are very, we are very fortunate to grow up and live in a multi-racial, multi-religious, multicultural organizations. And that we, have, we should have the ability to connect with all parts of the world and be friends with everyone in the world and look for areas we have in common and work together. Okay, I'm going to move on to uh, over here. Gentleman on my left, that's uh, Nick. And then uh, maybe I'll take two, both of your questions. Uh, Nick, you want to go first? Uh, good morning. Good morning, DPM. Uh, Nicholas, uh, I run a communications consultancy and ah. I also work at a think tank for international affairs. Uh, and as a former journalist, I'm afraid one of the hazards of my former job is that I have a lot of questions. So I have three questions, but as Steve was saying, I'll try to keep them quite short. Uh, well, you can just thanks. make it one. <laughs> I, can, I can lump it all together, but it'll be three separate things. Uh, the first question I have pertains to your point about how to win trust, uh, we have to trust uh, people with the truth. Uh, I think in today's environment, what the truth is, is becoming harder and harder to discern. Uh, whether it's fake news, whether it's uh, different forms of opinion and commentary and ideas from many different parts of society and the world. Uh, so how do we ensure that people actually are able to discern what the truth is? I think Hofma addresses some aspects of it, but it is a very complicated issue. Uh, and as the world becomes more and more complex, I think being able to have all the facts and the truth will, will become a, a more crucial part of it. Uh, the second question pertains to this notion of uh, topics that you talked about, the uh, uh, positioning between the US and China and other major powers. Uh, if we are to be guided by clear-eyed realism, as you mentioned, uh, in terms of our foreign policy, uh, is it realistic for Singapore to be able to hold to the old position of neutrality and being friends with everyone? Uh, I think PM Lee has, in fact, mentioned in, in recent months that it might not be that tenable in the future to say that I want to be completely neutral. So how, how are we going to manage those situations? Uh, and my last question pertains to leadership. You've shared a little bit about uh, the 4G team and, and the views and outlook and how the team will engage on the ground. Uh, based on the engagement so far, what do you think Singaporeans, especially younger Singaporeans, are looking for in leaders uh, for today and for tomorrow? Okay, okay, thanks for that. I think uh, maybe we could quickly address that because I thought you only had one question, that's why I offered the other guy a chance to us. So. Sorry. <laughs> but before we complicate things, you want to quickly address these questions? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first, uh, on, on, the, on the question about fake news, I think, first and foremost, I think early on, the, uh, the first uh, gentleman who asked the question said, at the end of the day, the best safeguard for democracy are you know, well-informed citizens who, uh, have a certain, who have a view of you know, what is good for Singapore. And I, I think we are starting this at all levels, first in our schools, 
there's a lot of um, uh, effort to help our school children learn about you know, what to trust and what not to trust. And uh, in particular, with the social media, with the internet, what is truth and what is untruth and how do we discern is, is going to be critical. And I will say, early on I mentioned about my experience in MOE. I mentioned about it takes a village to raise a child. So all of us have a role, whether as parents, as teachers uh, in the community, to help our young people to be able to uh, discern the truth uh, from the fake news. Eh? So that's the first thing. But you mentioned about POFMA. POFMA is also another very important safeguard in our law that we can debate and we can have different opinions, but different opinions must be based on facts, on truth. If you and I differ even on the basic facts, we have no basis for debating an issue. And that will be quite, not only unproductive, but potentially destructive. Now, on your US-China uh, issue about whether is it tenable for us to stay neutral, I say we should stay neutral for as, as, as far as possible. But at the end of the day, as a sovereign uh, nation, our decision must be based on what is in the long-term interest of Singapore and Singaporeans. So what action we take uh, must depend on is this, will this serve Singapore in the long run? And your last question on the leadership, you know, what, what, do we, uh, uh, what do I think the young people look forward to? Now, I have, I'll be happy to discuss with young people to hear your views. I, I think I know what you will be concerned with. But my basic thing that I would say is that first, I think every leader must have the integrity and have the interests of Singapore and Singaporeans at heart. You know, that is the starting point. And everything else, whether they do A, B, or C, or they are, they are this or that, that will be just part of that. And so how we can be more effective. But the character and motivation of our leaders is fundamental. And are they all on the same page in terms of this journey moving forward? Is there consensus within the cabinet, within the 4G leadership? On doing on this, this plan Singapore together? Moving, yes. Of course. Of course, in fact, this has been discussed uh, for quite a while. Uh, as I said, some of us entered in 2011, some earlier, some later. The one thing that we shared as we discussed is that in all our own experiences, whether my, our Singapore conversation experience or Grace and uh, Chun Singh's experience with SGE Future, or in the various ministries that they were working, uh, that they, they are working in, all the engagement efforts, whether it's with our VWOs, with our groups that care about the environment, or with our groups that care about seniors, the common factor that allowed us to make progress has always been a strong partnership with our people. So when we discussed how can we take it forward to the next level, uh, it was, we all agreed that we must do this. And not just, uh, one or two person agreeing, but you know, the whole team agreeing. And that's why in the coming uh, months, you will see each of them speaking on a particular topic that they are very passionate about. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got quite a few questions now. I'm going to come first to the, if you guys don't mind hanging on a second, to the gentleman in front there. I'll let you, let him, let's take his question first. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, DBM uh, mm -hmm. and Stephen. Okay, my name is Kwek Bin. I'm visually impaired. I work at Singapore Association of the Visually Handicapped. Thank you, DPM, for gracing our charity dinner earlier this year. Oh. Right, uh, I work at SAVH as two things. One is essentially an IT trainer for the visually impaired, especially focusing on those with little or no vision at all on the use of computers and smartphones. And uh, the other uh, part of my job is advocacy, right? so promoting our welfare of the visually impaired. Uh, there are, my bottom line is basically I like to call on the government to become more aware of the needs of the visually impaired, but um, because of my job and because it's, this is such a big thing, I would like to focus on the smart nation and more specifically on whether the smart nation is uh, really able to achieve the ideal of an inclusive smart nation. So I don't know how many people in this room are aware that you can be totally blind and still be able to start using an iPhone out of the box, literally and set it up without any assistance from sighted people. 
to some extent, you can do that for Android phones as well. Samsung phones are the best. Uh, you can actually do it for Huawei as well, but there are certain issues with Huawei right now. <laughs> right? So, um, yeah, so that's the thing. So, um, there are things built in to uh, smartphones, sometimes downloadable, which will make the phones talk. However, these tools uh, require that the apps and the software be written in ways which are compatible with these tools. Right? So, um, unfortunately, a lot of apps out there, including a lot of apps uh, done by agencies under the government, uh, a lot of apps, a lot of places, which are not compatible. So, this uh, presents a challenge. Right? And uh, with the push for digital payments, uh, right. uh, the top of which is uh, QR codes. Okay, quick minute, sorry, I'm going to cut you off here, but it, basically you're asking how can we use technology to also help us become a more inclusive country with uh, the examples you have given, for instance, I would right? say that uh, actually there are definitely ways, but I'm not sure if the government is aware of them. So I hope that the government would um, be uh, find out a little more before uh, implementing its uh, smart nation initiatives. Okay. Because like I said, QR code. If anybody was thinking about visual impaired, they would immediately recognize that this would pose a challenge to someone with visual right. impairment. So I'm uh, hoping that the government would uh, start, I'm uh, hoping this would be the start of awareness for everyone, okay. not just the government. Thank you for highlighting that. Thank so I think you're saying more, uh, a more discussion also in that yes. area, especially from those. Well, okay, let me first, I'm very happy to see you here today. And uh, you know, your, the two areas that you're working on, I think they are very, very meaningful. So on your suggestion about how do we be a more inclusive smart nation, I think that's a great idea. I would uh, convey this to Minister Vivian, uh, who incidentally is also, he was an eye surgeon before. So I, I'm sure he would uh, understand this well. I, I would uh, feedback to him to see what I can do. And also, uh, we welcome your ideas about what can be done, because obviously you have tried to do many of these things yourself. And uh, what you have been facing will be a very uh, useful input for us in seeing how we can do this better. So thank you very much, and uh, I think we should all give him a round of applause yeah. for that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to quickly come. I know you've been standing in line for a while. Gentlemen, on my left and then on my right. So, sir, in the black polo shirt, go ahead first. Thank you, Minister. My name is Yuvan. Um, I'm a banker and I'm a youth volunteer as well. So my question is, how do you amplify um, individuals, the future aspirations of individuals who are unable to meet present needs? So to give you a bit of context, I've done several youth conversations with uh, National Youth Council. And what I've come to realize is that those attendees are those who are able to afford the time and the resources to go for the particular event. Um, and for those who are not able to do so, I'm unable to get their needs. Second, even for those who attend, chances are the discussion revolves around their present circumstances rather than future aspirations. And third, even if I were to be able to solicit the future aspirations, how can I then amplify their messages to make sure that they're part of the Singapore narrative in the future? So how do you go about doing that? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take one more question as well. Yeah. We got that yeah, done. Go and sir? Hi, Mr. Heng. Uh, my name is uh, Seiwe. I see a fellow friend, Ellen. Yeah, I've got two questions, um, but perhaps maybe I'll give a short little bit of background by myself. Um, I'm age 45 this year, <laughs> um, still serving national service, now in my 20th year. Oh, right. <laughs> um, right. So right now, we are right in the middle of uh, the Goking Sui Command Staff College course. Oh, so, uh. Uh, yeah, it's a residential phase. So. Um, so my question is this, um, based on personal experience, how you, you mentioned about the, it takes a village to raise a, a child. Based on my present experience with my own daughter, how can we, or how can the government look into not marginalizing children that are caught right in the middle of uh, what you call the um, being sandwiched, you know, like in terms of whether if they have dyslexia, handicap or, or some handicap of sorts where, um, for example, my current experience is I've dealt with uh, the teachers of my daughter's school, the school itself, uh, SEAB, and MOE. So, so I couldn't find a, a, um, a, a understanding of how can we not marginalize the students or our kids in, in terms of building our future for Singapore in that uh, situation. Right. So the second part is... So, sorry, so what was your, what's your name again? Uh, Sewe. Sewe, and you're talking yeah. about, when you say not marginalised kids who have special needs specifically? Yeah, who has uh, special needs or even uh, handicapped things like uh, dyslexia. 
Right. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, it could be ranged from minor dyslexia to, to severe dyslexia. So they're still high-functioning. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So there are students, uh, children who are caught right in the middle of the, that evaluation uh, criteria. Mm -hmm. right? So how can, we, how, how can government look into Okay. Um, in other areas of not marginalizing Helping that specific right. group. Right. Okay, and sorry, very quickly, your second yeah. question? The second question is, um, I'm a believer of the notion that where the institution is only as good as the people in, in it, right? So, um, in terms of the 4G leadership, you know, I'm, I'm all for it, but I'm trying to understand how does the government look into employing the same kind of leadership, the same kind of thought methodology or the mindset to the people within the middle management? You know, people who are on the ground executing the policies or even evaluating things like when, you know, you submit applications for certain things. Usually, it doesn't go right to the top. It okay. gets to the middle management. So how do you, how does the government um, okay. employ so the you, leadership oh, oh, train oh, down? You're basically talking about all the other civil servants. Uh. Correct. <laughs> yes. So the boss says, do big, this, big, then big somewhere down the line, yes. you're like, hey, why, why, you know, yeah, it's lost yeah. in translation. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> where, do you want to, where do you want to start? Yeah. <laughs> well, let me start with Gilbert's question about uh, what can young people do. Okay. Uh, you know, and groups who just come for a conversation may not be the ones who need it most. I would say that a very good place to start is certainly in our schools. Because I was at a pre-U seminar just uh, two weeks back, and there was a group of students who came to talk to me during the, the break. And so I said, well, what are your concerns with? They said, well, uh, we're concerned with... Uh, uh, Children from families who may not be as well off, may not have the resources. So I said, well, uh, what can you do about it? So they looked at me, thought for a while, and then I suggested, I said, why don't we, you try something? That, do you think it would be a good idea if a primary five student were to help, say, a primary two student to read? You're all in the same school. You don't have to go and spend time and resources to go from point to point B. But every day, just 10 minutes, from your school, you just, during recess time, uh, you just take 10 minutes to read to them, help them with whatever that they might need help. Would that be a good idea? And they all thought, oh yeah, that's a good idea. So I think we, that's why I mentioned that in all these different areas, those of us who are in the front line, look, knowing the issues, are actually in a position to do something about it, rather than, oh, let's get the school to build more special uh, uh, facilities, employ more teachers to do all this because every one of us can do something. And one of the things that we must bear in mind too is that our uh, population is aging rapidly. So our ability to just keep hiring more and more people to do more very specific jobs will be uh, less and less. And so what we can do, each of us, uh, to make a difference at the point we can make the biggest impact will be something that we, we can do. Uh, take action on. And in the same way, uh, when I was in MOE, one of the very interesting programs that we have, which is, is this uh, character and citizenship education. And as part of that education, we have this values in action program. Students are not just talking about, it's good to do this, but those good values must be realized through action. And I'm very happy to see how our schools are doing many of this values in action program. And I hope that our schools can give more publicity to what the students are doing, then everyone can join them. Right. Now, on uh, Sungei's question about uh, the uh, marginalized, marginalized SPAT students. Now, again, when I was in MOE, we spent a lot of uh, time and effort on this. It is not, uh, the schools are actually doing quite, quite a bit. Uh, the, for the very more severe cases, we have uh, SPAT schools, the special needs schools. But for those which can be uh, we can stay in the mainstream schools. The teachers are making the making the effort. We have been having more training sessions for teachers, and I'll say that um, compared to certainly when I knew it years back when we started this, things have improved quite a bit. But these are evolving needs. So I would suggest that if we could be specific about what the areas of help you think would be useful. Uh, I will get uh, rich to communicate this to the school and then we can see how we can work on this. And again, this is another example of how active uh, citizenry can be a part of this. Because if the school said, well, how about A, B or C helping to do uh, certain action, 
then I think we can all work towards that. Whether some parents may be happy to volunteer to do some of that, that will be very helpful. Yeah. And just uh, his question also uh, about the uh, communication within, yeah, yeah. from leadership downwards. Well, um, I, somebody asked me a question, Gillian asked me a question about my travels all over the world recently. And I went to America, I was in, the, in China, I was in Japan. I met many uh, leaders, you know, both political leaders as well as business leaders. One thing which struck me was how across these different countries, the one thing that they said about, they like about Singapore is our public service. They felt very strongly that our public service is doing a very good job. You know, from schools to the police to the SAF to the officers implementing policies. Now, this is not to say that, you know, I'm not saying that we have no room to improve. There will always be room to improve. And I'm very happy that actually our head civil service has started what is called a public sector transformation program. So our, as, as we progress, our citizens also have higher expectations of what can be done. And technology also gives us greater opportunity to do things better. So there is a very concerted effort to continue to improve our public service. Now public service has been a major source of strength for, for Singapore. So we are determined to continue with this effort and uh, be assured that, again, this is, this is not something that's forgotten. There's a lot of effort that's going on. Uh, members of public may not see it, but I can assure you that there's a lot of work going on. And again, if you have specific issues uh, that you think could be improved, you're welcome to send your suggestions. I think it's an evolving situation. It's very much dependent on the person itself, the interaction, because Indeed. you probably remember that one time you went to some CPF counter and the guy said, cannot do this, I've got to go to this other department. And then that's why, la. that's why he's here asking this question. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank I, you. I should uh, just mention to you that very often residents come and see me during my MPS sessions and they say, oh, look, you know, it's unfair. They didn't allow me to do this. And I end up spending my time telling the, the resident that, I will write the letter for you, but I can assure you that there will be no change. Yeah. The, the reason is that it is a good policy, and unfortunately, the policy cannot be to all things to all people. The only way that we can do this is to stick to a certain policy. In some other cases, I've written for them, and the ministries have you know, agreed to make uh, either a change in the policy or make an exception. So there are some, we cannot, it cannot be that every time uh, an issue is raised that 100% will yeah. change. But I think sometimes it's yeah. empowering the staff on the ground to make certain decisions, which you think Indeed. seems common sense, right? You know, Indeed. but they don't feel empowered that way. Indeed. Okay, I'm sorry, sir. I'm going to cut you off. Uh, lady on my left has been there for a while. I know, I, and then the gentleman in the middle. So, yeah. you want to start first? Um, hello. Um, thank you, Mr. Hing, uh. and it's a privilege to be here. My name is Andy, and I work um, as a wildlife researcher. So oh. I work closely with Wildlife Reserve Singapore and Parks oh. and NUS. I want to build on Carl's point about biodiversity. So you mentioned about what we've been doing for you know, climate change, all the big scale, large scale uh, solutions. But I would like to just pull us back more, like smaller scale, local scale, about uh -huh. forest preservation in Singapore. And that even though Singapore is very small, we do have you know, precious forests left. Some people might say that those are built up and, you know, secondary forests might not be important, so we can do changes to it. But I'd just like to share my thoughts that they do preserve a lot of biodiversity and mm -hmm. it's actually better to just leave them alone. So that's, that's just one thought. Yeah. Another thought is that um, we have seen a video recently about the otters crossing the road in <laughs> Shenton Way. And it's really, really nice to see that people are trying to um, get them to cross safely and we care about our animals. But another point that I want to make is that um, the animals in Singapore are not viewed equally. So if it's the monkeys that's crossing a road or if it's the pigs that's crossing a road, <laughs> I think maybe oh. people might not care. So I'd just like to highlight this point that um, it's very important that we look at our native wildlife equally. And when you talk about building our future together for Singaporeans, our plants and animals are also... Singaporeans, so <laughs> it's really important that we do care for them. So that's just two yeah. thoughts. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Peter. I think we have a challenge. Sometimes even people we don't view equally. So I, that's that's why some people, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, we are horrible people ourselves, you know. So okay, thank you, uh, sir. In the middle, yes, go ahead, sir. 
Uh, hi, uh, Mr. Heng, good to see you. My name is Siva, I'm from NUS and I'm uh, active in nature and environment circles. So the nature people didn't wait for government to come to us, we went to them. So there's a history of several decades of engagement. Right. So what I notice now, it's um, very encouraging. We are having a lot of engagements with many agencies. But the efficiency of the engagement often boils down to specific individuals. So the mechanism is not institutionalized. The culture is not yet there. If one appointment holder changes, you can almost think the, all the positive practices of the previous appointment holder. So if going forward, we want to have more engagement, um, I think maybe the agencies involved would uh, require training. Um, just a few nights ago, we had an engagement and it nearly tanked because there was a new person in charge who didn't understand um, how the engagement works. So that's of great concern because there are a lot of positive examples, um, but often we have to start all the way from right. scratch, from ground zero. Okay, My second that. point is, yes. uh, in this long history of engagement, we do see systemic problems, but during the engagements, we are clo too close to the issue. What mechanism would you suggest to talk about holistic level uh, problems that we have ideas to resolve? Right. Okay. okay. Are, are there any other uh, nature-related climate? I'm, I'm just trying to bundle <laughs> them together so we can address them at once. Anyone? No? Oh, uh, gentlemen, then maybe if we can just take your question oh, okay. as well. Yeah, I think that'll be a bit easier. We are a bit pressed for time. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, my name is Xiang Tian. I am a student at SIT, but also run an informal environmental group called Lei Park in SG. Yeah. So, anyway, my question is about, uh, you mentioned uh, climate change and environmental issues several times in your speech, which is, which is quite good. But my question is, um, all government and to a certain extent, like NGOs are serious about environmental issues and climate change. How do we ensure that our businesses also practice responsible uh, practices? Yeah. So for example, DBS, they said they will not fund coal anymore, but then they are still involved in a coal power plant in Indonesia. So how do we ensure that our businesses are responsible? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. You want to take well, those? So let, let me answer the three questions on environment. Yeah. It's interesting that so, so, so many of you are so uh, passionate about this, and uh, the good news is that, uh, in fact, the very first of our uh, session on this engagement is about sustainability, and Minister Masagos will be speaking on this very soon. So I, this will be very good feedback for him. Now, first, uh, on Amy's point about um, the biodiversity, the importance in local forests uh, and you know, different types of animals, first on the local forests, I would say that we, we actually do a reasonable job of this of uh, keeping many of the... Uh, for, for a city that is so small and is so urbanized, uh, we actually have quite a good green cover. And uh, there are many of these spaces which I see many Singaporeans uh, going. A few weeks back, I was at the Bukit Timah Reserve and I met a group of uh, bird watchers. They came with really sophisticated cameras and so on. And they were telling me how they went about the different parts uh, to take photographs uh, in Singapore. And I said, oh, I didn't realize and uh, you know, even the migrating birds and so on is a great. But, but ZPN, sorry, can I jump yeah. in? Let me bundle all the questions together. Mm. Can will there come a point in time where animals will have almost the same rights as human beings here yeah. in Singapore, <laughs> besides just a bridge over the PIE? <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and will we see a point where also the, the government will be able to reach out better to the NGOs, the organisations that are working with, well, without having to rely on the person they made friend with before? I, changes, you know. So, so earlier on, I mentioned that this, will, this is an evolving situation. Yeah. We cannot expect that all the situations that uh, we will be able to agree the hundred percent, unless we all agree to be vegetarians. Yeah. <laughs> when they say about all animals being equal, but I, I see that uh, views are changing, and that there are, there's a lot more, especially among our young people, that they care for biodiversity, they care for animals of all kinds. So this is something which will evolve, I think, over time. Then second, on the Siva's question on the engagement of different individuals and so on. Now, this will be a learning process, as I said, for, for all. 
we must not, I hope I did not create an expectation that tomorrow, anyone that says anything, the institution or the agency will then react and say, yes, I agree with you, let's go and do this together. Because I think there must be certain constraints which uh, some agencies will have to uphold mm -hmm. and that they cannot just move and say, well, let us now, you know, don't build a road here, don't do anything here. Uh, there, there has to be some uh, broader factors that need to be taken into account. It cannot be a decision is based only on one factor. But is it yeah. possible to have better, the more, uh, more appropriate people perhaps in uh, the position who better understand the situation of so what I, dealing So I mentioned with? earlier on that this is a learning process on both sides. That the government agencies will have to learn and that if there's a good idea, if the idea is better than what the officers may have thought about, of course we should adopt the better idea. But at the same time, those of us who give ideas must also accept that sometimes, as I said in my speech, must accept that not every idea will be accepted in total, in total, uh, or if it's part of the idea, we should be, we'll make progress along the way rather than it must be zero or nothing. Okay. Then on the third question, I think it about, uh, about what, the businesses. what can businesses do? Yeah, can well, I put it as a yes or no? So will it, is it possible well, actually, that... Business, many businesses are doing that. So for instance, uh, MAS, for example, have found that many financial institutions are now very interested in issuing green bonds. Uh, I was uh, at the launch of this uh, report for monetary and financial institutions and the report showed that sustainability was a very big theme for many of the financial institutions, especially those in Europe. So I see this as an evolving process and I see that many of our, with our carbon tax, many institutions are taking it seriously and making the changes. And again, it's not something that overnight we'll see everywhere clean and green. Mm -hmm. it, it is the work of a generation, as I said earlier in my speech. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, I'm going to go to the right. Uh, just wait a moment. I've got a, quite a few people standing there, so I'll take gentlemen the white shirt. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, DPM. Uh, uh, my sorry, name please, is... please try and keep your questions short. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. My name is Mohamed Anes. Uh, I'm currently the president of uh, SMU A Political. Uh, I'm a Reach and Roses uh, Peace Ambassador as well. Um, you were once PPS to Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and he mentioned you being his best PPS. Uh, recently, you also mentioned that uh, the biggest unknown challenge that Singapore will face in the future is the nature of politics. Uh -huh. My question is, since then, how has leadership and politics changed over the years since LKY? And what does it take to lead the country forward in today's challenging times? Right. My second question, uh, as a youth, um, how can we help to co-create and write the next chapter of Singapore under your premiership in the future? Okay, oh, thank, you. thank you. I'll come to the middle here, which was you at the mic. Just go ahead. Lady in red, please go ahead. Thank you, Minister. Um, I like the heartfelt speech for you, with you. I'm a working mom of two kids and expecting a third. So I'm doing a form of national service as well. <laughs> so uh, procreate, yeah. So, um, so my question is... Um, how the comments about um, our youths or our Singaporeans at large that we are no longer hungry. So how do we actually ensure that we can continue to be competitive and that our youths are actually will, will be hungry so that we can have the bright future together? And also, how do we reduce attrition to overseas? So, for example, when we send our kids overseas for studies, but um, you know, sometimes uh, you hear them, they never come back. So how do we actually um, keep our talents within Singapore? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay, and I'll just come, one more question over here, sir. Yes, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, good morning, uh, DPM. My name is Farid. Um, I'm a cancer physician. And you mentioned earlier <coughs> about um, the dangers of society fracturing right. along um, class lines and the importance of um, preserving social mobility. And I, I share your concerns, and I think this is absolutely critical to Singapore's future. Um, you know, as a healthcare professional, I see that um, while a broad cross-section of Singaporeans have access to basic healthcare, actual health outcomes are very uh, dependent on socioeconomic status. It's, mm. it's, uh, it's very clear. So uh, you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, efforts to um, sort of uh, beef up um, early childhood education, which I think is, is, is critical. But um, are there deeper and broader strategies to sort of um, reduce... Uh, class inequality. To that end, could I ask a very specific question? Is it time to perhaps think about reforming our taxation system to be 
even more progressive, you know, perhaps less um, uh, emphasis on consumption taxes, introducing, introducing things like inheritance taxes, um, you know, to try and bridge uh, the socioeconomic divide. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Yes. Got lots of big questions there. Okay. Lots of big questions. Yeah. yeah. Well, first, uh, Muhammad's question about um, the nature of politics uh, since the time of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Now, as, I'm, as I alluded to in my speech, I think in the earlier generation of leaders, they live in very turbulent times. And the, our people, I remember growing up during that time, that for me and most of my generation, the key issue was do we have food on the table and how do we work towards that? So all of us were united with one goal. I see many people nodding their heads. And so that, that made it, uh, you know, so staying united, moving from the turbulent times of having misunderstandings across race, language, and religion. And the things that I mentioned about how we managed to build a multiracial society, uh, managed to grow the economy, build our nation, that was a very big rallying call. Now, what is, how is it different today? Well, what is different today is that our people are far more diverse, both in terms of their backgrounds, in terms of their views, in terms of their needs. And uh, even, you know, as I said, most, of, most people have lives have improved, most families have improved by leaps and bounds, but there are still some segments who may be left behind. So what do, what do we need to do? I think we need to mobilize our society to really all work together to uplift everyone. And that's why Indrani's Uplift Project, for example, and what Desmond and uh, uh, Ikang are going to do in this area are important parts of our work. And what's the role then youth and like him the youth can be involved? And the role of youth? Well, plenty. I think uh, I, I mentioned the story earlier on about you know, students in the schools. Every one of us, whether you are young or old, can find a practical way in which you can make a difference. And that is why my speech is about how everyone can play our part to make the lives of people around us better, to make uh, Singapore uh, even better. So the use, I hope that with all your energy, uh, there will be plenty of things that you can do. And earlier, we, we heard many such organizations. Now, the second uh, question... How do we the, get, them, get them hungry? That's the thing, right? Hungry. Our kids are so sheltered nowadays. Life yeah. is so good. So, so, so they're first, not hungry. Uh, uh, let, let me congratulate you on having two and the third one coming. Uh, <laughs> this is that be a uh, wonderful no, news. A, uh, okay. Sorry, pressure. No pressure. <laughs> well, well... We'll be all be very happy. Yeah, talk, right? I'm sure you would, especially. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it, it is not. Uh, so this is a generational change that we are we are facing. You know, in in our days there was not much on, on the table. So everybody, uh, in fact, I recall that all the students whom uh, I knew from overseas, almost everyone came back to Singapore to serve. You know, there's no one who say, "Well, lives are better." So creating opportunities in Singapore is important, and which is why we put in so much effort to transform our future economy. Recently, I was in Silicon Valley, spoke to about three, 400 Singaporeans and Southeast Asians who were in Silicon Valley, and I asked them, uh, are you going to come back? The one thing which touched me a great deal was many of them said, you know, it was great that I was, I mean, Silicon Valley learning all sorts of things, but Singapore is still home. Dad and mom are still home. I would like to go back. And uh, I think creating that bond is, is very important in the very, at the outset. And that is why when I was education minister, I, I spoke about the importance of you know, parents being supportive. Because if the bonds, the family bonds are built early on, that would be great. And at the same time, I think we must create opportunities for our young people to feel that this is not just a place where I'm earn a living, but this is a place where my ties are, my families are, my friends are, uh, and I hope that we can do more of that. Now, how do we make them more hungry? Uh, this is a good question. I, I don't have a simple solution, but the, the Singaporeans I met in Silicon Valley, uh, I thought they were very hungry. I hope that uh, many more will also explore the opportunities in our region, but at the same time, they will also uh, see that Singapore is home. I was very, recently I met a group of Singaporeans who have been away in China for about 20 years, making, becoming very successful. I spoke to them, and I was very happy that two of them have decided to set up their branch office in Singapore and coming back. And the main reason, dad and mom are home. 
So I, I think that we should build that uh, strong bonds. The third uh, question Moving on, on to uh, the healthcare and healthcare inequalities. Inequality and so on. Now actually, when you look at our healthcare system, if the, in fact, two reports have just been issued. One is the World Bank uh, report on education and health. Uh, this was launched during the IMF World Bank meeting. And pre uh, President Jim Kim, the president of World Bank, had a dialogue session with uh, Prime Minister Lee. The reason why he had a session with Prime Minister Lee is that Singapore is number one on that World Bank ranking. So when I spoke to Jim, I said, why do you ask PM Lee to speak? Because what, what is your objective? He said, well, what is remarkable about that report is that Singapore did not spend the most amount of money on education and healthcare, but you have the best outcome. And I wanted this to be an example for many developing countries who feel that I must spend a lot of money before I get good outcomes. So the question is, how do we spend the money in ways that make a difference? And we have, and I think if you measure by all index, both that as well as a recent report on uh, uh, children around the world, Singapore's performance for children around the world on a whole range of measures of health and is again number one. So I think we should, there are specific areas where we need to intervene, where we need to help. So the PG package, Pioneer Generation is one example, the Medica Generation package. And then of course we have a whole 3M framework for dealing with health. Well, whether the gaps can be better met, well, this is an issue that we must continue to look at whether we can improve. But Which also have, addresses his last question about yeah. taxation. So do, do yeah. we need more money? Do we just, uh, shall we well, tax differently? Uh, okay, so you ask, can, can we increase, instead of increasing GST from seven to nine, can we think of other taxes? Well, I actually went through many spreadsheets and looked at various options. The, and it is not, you know, no finance minister wants to increase taxes, but it, it is not an easy decision for me. I took a long time to mull over it to see what is the best way that can, take, that can continue to keep Singapore vibrant, that can continue to keep our uh, economy vibrant, as well as meet the many needs. So there are many competing uh, objectives. So you mentioned about why not have a wealth tax. Well, many countries have abolished that because they found that there are, it is just there are ways to get around a, wealth, a, a state duty, for example. So there are no uh, options that are straightforward. For instance, the one thing which I hope many Singaporeans will appreciate is that the biggest source of revenue for our, in our last two years for our budget is not GST, it's not personal income tax, it's not even corporate income tax. Even though yeah, the biggest portion, anybody knows the answer? It's our reserve, reserve. right? NIRC, the, our net investment return contribution. How did that come about? Well, in the earlier years of our growth, we were, the economy was growing so well, but we were, our earlier generation of pioneers and, and leaders were very careful not to just spend the money. As a result of which, a country with no oil, no diamond, no silver, nothing, right, even have to import our water, is able to keep a reserve that now gives us more income than any other source. Which means that if we are not careful, if I hadn't had that, the GST will not be 7 to 9. It will be 7 to 15 and not enough. Yeah. So, so I hope that uh, we will have to guard this very carefully. And I will continue to think hard about how we can generate uh, better resources for our people. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to just uh, take all the questions that are left on the floor. Uh -huh. For the rest of you who haven't come out, I'm sorry, but we have no more time for that. <laughs> I'm coming to the lady in the front first, and then I'll take a few more from the back. So, uh, or who was it in the front row here? Had oh. a question? Just take one first. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, Richard Kapasami from the Disabled People's Association. Um, we're a cross disability uh, nonprofit uh, representing uh, the disability community. Um, so, my question for you in Singapore, only 4.8% of working age disabled people are employed, which makes up for less than 0.55% of the overall national workforce. So, 
disabled people face uh, discrimination in the workplace, mm -hmm. um, a lack of opportunity in education, which then hampers their ability to get into, into employment in the future. But it's not for uh, a lack of trying or a willingness to work. Uh, it's down to employers and, and the infrastructure that we mm -hmm. have. How can government agencies and stat boards lead by example in diversity and inclusion where the private sector uh, hasn't shown enlightenment in this? And beyond sort of the tokenism of roles like uh, NMPs, uh, how can we get better public sector representation of persons with disabilities so that disabled people are advocating uh, for themselves? Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'll come to the lady in the back there. Morning, sir. Yes, go ahead. My name is Satna. I work with the Criminal Legal Aid Scheme administered by the Law Society Pro Bono Services. I'm a full-time pro bono lawyer. Um, my job is to represent the underprivileged accused persons, get access to justice, and therefore fairer outcomes in court. My question is, um, what more can we do to help these individuals living on the fringes of society to break out of the poverty cycle and the reoffending cycle. The context for my question is this, in the course of representing over hundreds of these accused persons, the most common theme that I, I find is that they feel that they are unseen by the government, they are unheard, and while they receive a lot of help from the CDCs and the family care uh, uh, service uh, uh, centers, they find that this just seems to tide them over for the meanwhile, but doesn't help them to sort of rise above or break out of the poverty cycle. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what more can we do for these individuals to be seen, for their families to be assisted, beyond just topically administering aid, but also just ensuring that in the long run they're assisted um, by either finding jobs, not just ad hoc jobs, but full-time um, um, jobs that could that could uh, sustain their families. No, the second no. very quick comment I had, I understand we're running low on time, is just a suggestion on how, given the number of environmental concerns that have been elevated, perhaps we can raise environmental issues to really an issue of national concern by elevating it as a pillar of defence. We've included digital defence as one of the, the sixth pillars, environmental issues which are equally important, if not more important, should also be elevated as a pillar of defence such that it becomes something of national concern. Maybe that way we can ensure that as a society and even businesses that enter Singapore see it as a concern as opposed to just paying lip service to it. Thank okay, you, sir. Thank you. I'll just take one more question from the middle here, gentlemen. Hi, uh, my name is Stephen Wong. I'm an academic at the Singapore Institute of Technology, but I also volunteer as the president of the Association of Information Security Professionals. So uh, to DPA, uh, DPM's comment about the democracy of deeds, I must say that within the association, there are many volunteers. It's very heartening to see that a lot of them spent long hours after their office hours volunteering. Some of them have taken leave until they ran out of leave to volunteer anymore. So that's a good thing. But uh, I think my question uh, is more towards the thing about Singaporeans being kiasi, kiasu, and kia So uh, in terms of the kiasi, I think uh, the, the question here is, in a way, how, how, how would the 4G government encourage both the public and the private sector to be a bit more risk-taking to be able to embrace more failures, to learn from the failures and rebound from those. So that's the Gyasi part. The Gyasu part is really, in terms of uh, Singapore in the past, I mean, we have a good leadership, we have strategic, uh, how strategic compet competitive edge in terms of our geographical location, us as a reliable, trusted brand, Singapore as a trusted brand. But going forwards, will this competitive advantage still remain relevant to us in the next 10, 20 years? And what is the new competitive advantage we might need to create so that Singapore stays relevant? So that Singapore stays competitive and so that Singapore survives. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, first on, on the uh, uh, on Richard's question about disa uh, uh, disabled persons, well what can what can we do for the infrastructure and so on? And how can we have this in fact your uh, comments are very similar to what uh, was mentioned earlier on about the even our smart uh, nation effort. So I, I'm, uh, I'm glad to hear that you know, there's, there's such interest in this and that whether we become a more inclusive society depends very much not just on what the government can do but what every one of us can do. But certainly, the government uh, needs to take a lead in some of this effort. 
So I would reflect this to my colleagues for them to take a look as to what specific things we can do. When I was in MOE, we spent a lot of time looking at needs of uh, special needs uh, children. And I, I would say that there was quite a, a bit of improvement when I was there. But uh, this is very much a work in progress. As we make one improvement, there will always be the next step to take and the next step to take. And it's a continuous process. So I hope that we'll continue with this journey to make continuous improvement. Will the government uh, be able to lead the way in that yes. sector, to lead by example? And well, in some areas, I think that the government is, is doing so. But what else we can do that will be appropriate, uh, that will be useful, this is something that uh, we will discuss further. And I look forward to your, your inputs on this. On the second area, on the, uh, uh, the yeah, cycle of poverty. Now, this is uh, that we need to tackle this at various levels. The first and foremost is really de depending on the circumstance of the, the family. The most important really is, particularly for the young children, good family structure is, is key. And I've seen a lot of uh, very good efforts in this area. So for instance, uh, SMS Maliki, he actually started this uh, space for which he gets these uh, children who are at risk to come together and for which they provide a very good holding environment for them to do their homework, for them to have uh, fun and so on. And I noticed that many of this actually being done across different parts. Now, you mentioned that uh, whether is it just you know, they, they get help from CDCs. Uh, I'm glad that if they are getting help from the CDC, then they are not forgotten. The, there are people who are helping them. Question is, can this be uh, done better? Uh, as, a, as a member of parliament, I have in my constituency, in fact, in all, most of our constituencies, we have this family service centre. We work together with them, referring some of these difficult cases because a whole range of intervention is needed, whether it's counselling, whether it's education, whether it's jobs. Uh, I have experiences helping some to look for jobs, but some stay and then they make a breakthrough, some didn't, and therefore it end up with a more difficult cycle. So I think I would say that it is, not, uh, it is not a straightforward thing that we do A and then you will get results immediately. If very often we need many people to help, many helping hands to, to uh, direct our efforts at this. And we've got to think about how best we can do this for the various groups. But I would say that, again, if you look at the macro uh, uh, picture, uh, Singapore's situation, while we can continue to improve, is on the whole not bad. Our crime rates have come down. The, the problems associated with many of this have come down, certainly compared to the times when I was a police officer. You know, I, I saw many more fouls, which, which was very painful. I saw so many cases where in a whole file, you see that person going in and out of DRC all their life. You know? And it is a very painful experience. But I always love the tagline which says, low crime doesn't mean no crime. Yes, indeed. It's very memorable. Um, and then she did mention about environment being a possible pillar Whether of defense. I think a, that's just a, uh, maybe you hold that thought. Uh, I don't think you can answer that right now. Uh, and I'll just... Let that sit because of more suggestion. That yeah. one he can, you can take to uh, Mr. Masagos and he can yeah. sit with that for a while. Yeah, and uh, Stephen's <laughs> question about. Uh, and Stephen, what about. Yeah, Kiasu, Kiasi, and. Uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah Kiasu, Kiasi. Well, can we just kia, kia a bit more, maybe? <laughs> well, and you asked about what is Singapore's competitive edge in the future. I would say, first, many of the things that uh, we stand for as being trusted is of great value. For example, I recently met a whole group of investors who decided that they were going to relocate their R&D facilities to Singapore because we have very good IP protection. And I've mentioned uh, in several of my speeches on the economy about building Singapore as a global Asia node of technology, innovation, and enterprise. Why global? Because we have been connected globally for a long time. And Asia, because we are in the heart of a vibrant, growing Asia. Why technology and innovation? Because I think this is going to power growth in the future years. And uh, why enterprise? Because it's not just good R&D results, but whether our business people, our workers, have that creativity to apply it to a practical uh, use. And with that, and with a trusted, uh, being a trusted node, it will take us very far. But the key is that, as somebody mentioned earlier on, we must encourage our people to go out to the world, to make friends with the world. 
And being a Singaporean growing up in a multiracial, multireligious environment gives us a great edge to be able to connect with people from all over the world. Okay, they've told me I've got five minutes left, but I know I can't finish all of those questions for, for those on the ground. So with DPF's mission, we will cover why, why all, not? everyone who's Anyone left who's standing, on the, yes. who's left standing? Yes. okay, and then yeah. we'll complete the session. So yeah, uh, yeah sister, over there, I think, can you go ahead, please? Uh, good. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for inviting, inviting me, and I take it as a very privileged moment. Uh -huh. And in your ROU in 2009, after the budget, you know, you invite... You, invite more VWOs from religious group to build the society. Yeah. And here we are. I've been in a nursing home, St. Joseph nursing home, for the last 30 of years and have enjoyed the, the care you know, from, from the very beginning till now with the new facilities. And I think we all come together as Singaporeans that we are efficient, we are honest, we are just, but I hope we will not be very soulless and heartless. <laughs> You know, that is where is our responsibility. And I would just like to ask Minister that transformation, innovation in the society is also, we also have a part to play in the nursing home. Maybe there will be a group of you that are able to listen to us, heart to heart talk, that we have our aspiration, we have our inspiration, whatever it is. We are not only trying to create experience, but want to create impact that right. the that the younger generation can move forward. We are also in a society that, in a nursing home, that we, we want to really let the pioneer generation, those mm. who are with us, mm. to die in peace, but not in pieces. Mm. But, and <laughs> that, with that, I think we want to also inject life into their remaining days. Right. So maybe, as Minister of Finance, give us a little bit of more financing to, to work around the policy, because it's not one policy that fits all. For human being, I think give us a chance. Listen to us in the next time, or maybe visit us because we are struggling uh -huh. in terms of the policy manpower. But we want to really give the best to their last days, and that is very important. Thank okay. you very yeah, much. Thank you. And give thank them you. better peace of mind, yeah. if I may say. <laughs> okay, we will just take another comment. Gentleman in white, go ahead. Hi, my name is John. Uh, I'm currently 19. I study at Nian Poly Engineering Sciences. Um, for me, what uh, makes what prides me as a Singaporean is that even in my commute to here, you know, I saw someone giving up the seat for someone who's more needy. Oh. I feel that what makes a Singaporean a Singaporean isn't your race, religion, or uh, what your ideas are, but your values. And I'd like to highlight uh, the Monica Bay incident. And many people, my, myself included, uh, started to point at the school immediately. I feel that that, that isn't right. Like, uh, what you've said, you know, um, it doesn't take, it takes the whole of Singapore to, build, to raise a child. Mm. And uh, for me, uh, you know, uh, being a student, they have been through VIA or any of these, uh, and I believe every school has a similar, uh, same um, development uh, uh, program um, that I realized that it's not graded, you know, um, regardless of uh, what you do during that program, you know, it doesn't really affect your grades. And I feel that this is sending a wrong message to um, the youths Know, and telling them that you know um, it's not as important, I feel that uh, more could be done not only by the school but also by government policies um, to ensure that you know the youth of our nation have these Singaporean values that you know we hold so dearly to, uh, the, these values that make Singapore what it is today to make it an inclusive society. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll just take one more from uh, the front here. Yes, good morning, DPM. I'm here. Yeah, my name is Carol. I'm, uh, I have got two teenagers. Uh -huh. I have been volunteering in my children's school for the past 10 years. Uh, for the past two years, I've also been a digital literacy educator, uh -huh. talking to families about how we navigate media and technology. What I'm seeing on the ground is that many families are struggling with different issues, uh, dealing with media and technology, dealing with having conversations, difficult conversations with our children. My question is, um, as we talk about building our future Singapore together, actually every family is building our future Singapore mm -hmm. every day of our lives. Right. How, uh, and we want to move towards a, a resilient nation. How can we support families to be more resilient? Because when families are strong, our nation can be strong together. Uh, and also, how can we work together to really bring into reality every parent a supportive partner in education? Thank you. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. First, uh, 
uh, on the sister's question first, uh, let me thank sister for all your the work, the good work that you have done, and your you and your colleagues over the years to look after. You know, because indeed, I think many of you here have been doing extremely meaningful work, making an impact to the lives of people all around you. So let me thank everyone for this tremendous contribution. So on your, uh, may, may I ask, sister, is St. Joseph uh, Nursing Home an IPC? Yes. Institution okay. of Public Character? Ah, oh, that, that's excellent. So in fact, this year, uh, it's our bicentennial year. We, I've, uh, at the budget, announced this uh, bicentennial um, uh, support for our IPCs, where we hope that this will help all our IPCs to raise funds for what they are doing. And I hope that uh, Singaporeans will support our IPCs strongly in this. Essentially, the, <clears throat> the package is such that we, uh, there will be a 250% tax deduction, then plus a matching grant. So for instance, uh, for every IPC, the limit is 400,000 Singapore dollars. Suppose somebody donates, uh, a company donates 400,000 uh, dollars. Because of the tax deduction that they get, actually they will only be, they're getting back 200,000. The government will contribute the 200,000. In addition, the government will also support with the matching of the 400,000. So therefore, the IPC can raise $800,000 when the company is only, company only need to put up $200,000. So I hope that all our IPCs can do that. In fact, just yesterday, I was with uh, the community chess uh, because there was a thank you lunch to thank the big donors who had contributed significantly to ComChess. And for ComChess, there's an even, because ComChess takes care of so many IPCs, that there's an even bigger uh, limit. So I hope that uh, Singaporeans will take, and all our friends in Singapore, will take this opportunity for us to contribute to uh, meaningful causes like this. And on your uh, question about what else can we do, I'll be very happy to get uh, the relevant officers to talk to you and to see what are the issues that you are faced, uh, faced with and we can make a difference. Uh, on John's point about uh, you know, whether the values in action should be uh, graded, my view is that it should not be because then you know, it, it, will, it will lead to uh, behaviours which we may not desire because people will begin to say, you are helping me, Chris, uh, you know, Steve, because you want to get a good grade, you want to get an A for being kind. Actually, you are not kind. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that will defeat the purpose. In fact, uh, I did something a little softer than that. I started an EduSafe Character Award. For the first time in our EduSafe events, which used to just award academic achievement, I started an EduSafe Character Award. When I first uh, put it out, uh, the media was uh, very unhappy with me because they said, how can you equate good character with, you know, as if you are getting a prize? But my objective was a very simple one, which is just to put it on the attention of parents and schools that character and values matter and therefore we want to emphasize just a small number of students who are doing great work that this is equally important in our schools, not just academic grades. So we, there will be practical ways we can do that, but maybe not to grade them. To, to, yeah. to recognize that action. And I think John asked that because he doesn't have children yet. So John, you forget that when your kids take exams, you also take exams. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Then on uh, Carol's question about uh, you know, your point that every family builds the future of the nation, I think you're absolutely right. So how do we get families to, to be more resilient? Um, the, in fact, I, I was hoping to get ideas from you because since you are doing much of that, and interestingly, you mentioned that you are digital uh, literacy, uh, you are doing work on digital literacy. And that is one very important area for us to work on because uh, how many of us have so often been to restaurants and you see a whole family gathering there eating, but everyone on their mobile phone <laughs> instead of having a nice view and having a family time. So those are things that we have to watch out for. And I fully agree with you that the social media, which I mentioned in my speech, can end up with us being in a very close circle. And that's why events like this where you know, so many of you are gathered here to talk to one another is excellent. And I hope that we can organize more of such events. Okay.
Yeah. We'll just come round the room. I'll start from my right and take the gentleman there. Go ahead, oh. please. Good morning, Minister. Uh, my name is Amik. I'm currently a trainee at a law firm and a director at a tech startup. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah. okay, so basically my question is that with the rise of China's power, uh, economic power, how much more can the government assist young students and youths like myself or in tech startups to benefit from China's economic rise? Because in the context of this question right now I want to give is that when I was in studying at NUS Law at that point of time, I interned in Indonesia perfectly fine. There were certain institutional uh, institutions that helped to establish the networks and allow me to get an internship over there. But when it comes to China itself, I had certain difficulties as a non-Chinese individual. So what I did was I picked up Chinese for one year in NUS on top of my law studies so I could speak and write. And when I worked in China, they were, they were quite interested in the fact that if you are non-Chinese, you must be able to translate English work. So I taught them Singapore law so that they can develop their, one of their provinces. So given those context, my finding was that as a non-Chinese individual, we want to apply for internships and, ex and benefit from China's growth. There are certain hurdles that we have to pass. So how much can you assist in terms of not just the non-Chinese, but everyone else in trying to benefit from China's rise? Right. Okay. That one I think can skills future. You can learn Chinese, right? That, that's the key. I mean, that's the first step. I know they have those courses. Okay, uh, Lady Purple, yeah. Um, hi, Minister. I'm Violet. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Lunch, actually, which is uh, one of the SDN-accredited uh, dating agencies. So uh, today we are here to talk about building our future Singapore together. So definitely uh, to have a future, we need to have more children. Yeah. So we know that um, you know, we have a declining birth rate and a lot of it is also because uh, people are getting married later and later in life. So I just want to hear your thoughts on uh, what more can we do together because you're saying that you know, we want to build Singapore together. So uh, for example, Minister Grace and Minister uh, Josephine have actually done a lot. Um, but I'm just wondering if it's time that we might need to take more drastic actions. So for for example, you know, we have a lot of very well-educated uh, young women, you know, like they are doing very well in their career, but um, at the same time, you know, they might not have been able to find the right one yet. So one of the questions would be, um, you know, would allowing them to freeze their eggs at some point help to, you know, like give them that opportunity to have children? And um, secondly, um, definitely, you know, uh, dating in university is the best time to meet people because everybody is single. So um, is there any way that um, we, we are able to encourage this? And uh, last but not least, um, so for example, as one of um, the accredited agencies, uh, we are only able to take up to 20% of uh, non-Singaporeans and uh, non-PRs. Um, as members, um, but at the same time, you know, like um, because there are um, uh, more diversity now, and sometimes um, the the best fit might not be uh, fellow Singaporeans. So, just want to hear your views on uh, maybe you know to uh, help our singers. It's uh, it also takes a village. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Violet. I'll just take one more one more question, lady here. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. My name is Nancy, Nancy Fu. I'm a mother of uh, autistic uh, children, and um, I've been involved myself uh, supporting children with autism with a group of parents, and our parents grow, the number of parents grow. So what I'm trying to say over here, um, Minister, is that um, we parents have, we, we dealt with issues of our special needs children. We have come across uh, real issues, and then we have recommendations. But we want to ask how, how supportive is government of uh, voluntary sectors uh, and groups uh, towards um, our call. And uh, when we raise issues, uh, we raise issues not only to benefit children of our biological own, but also to the special needs uh, at large in Singapore. And being, uh, building on inclusion in Singapore is really you know, building good character and value. And this ultimately will lead to good Singaporeans and a good Singapore. Yeah. So sorry, so, so your question was more how, how can the government reach out better to these groups or support these yes, groups? Yes, correct. When we have issues and we have good recommendations, and then the, how supportive is government towards, towards, towards us? Mm, okay, yeah. all right, thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, so first, uh, let me ask the, the, answer the question on the, how can we help young people to uh, you know, write on China's rise. Um, generally, we, are, we have done a number of things which is to help our young people to go overseas to have an attachment program. So that's one, one way. And you mentioned that you are running a startup. We also have a program for startups where we started this program called the Global Innovation Alliance, where 
we set up centers in uh, different parts of different cities of the world where innovation activities are very vibrant. In fact, uh, we opened one in uh, Beijing and then now one in Shanghai. And uh, later on, we'll consider places like Shenzhen. So where our young people can go there, not just young, any innovator can go there, interact with them, with the innovators over there, get support from our economic agencies, ESG, uh, to look at how they can understand the markets better and how their applications can be scaled and also to get in touch with uh, VCs and so on. So that those activities are there, but specifically on your law bit, now that one, I don't know what are the specific requirements of the, the Chinese government. In all places, when you want to practice law, there are specific requirements that you have to meet, including language proficiency and so on. So that one, uh, you would have to, I would have to check in details what exactly are needed and uh, what you can do. And, on the, um, and I should just add that uh, on the technology front, we are going to host in November two events. One is the Singapore FinTech Festival. It's now the largest in the world. And the other is the Singapore Week of Innovation and Technology. So we're all going to do it together in November, from November 11 to 11, November 14. So you're welcome to take part in that. On Violet's question about um, you know, what to do with... Uh, how to get our young people to date and marry. Now, this is an issue which I know uh, Josephine, Grace have been putting in a lot of uh, effort. Now, uh, what can we do more in the universities? I know that they have tried a, a number of things. Uh, the, what we need is really that we, had, we need all of us to be more encouraging. It's not easy because as all over the world, as people become better educated, they are more exposed, they, the interests tend to also diverge. And finding a location where people can meet is not, not so as easy as before. And at the same time, uh, many people have different priorities. Because they feel that, look, if I can earn my own living, I don't need to, uh, to have a boyfriend or girlfriend. And uh, we all have to focus on the value of a family and the value of a relationship with someone so I don't have a, a simple answer to it. Um, what can what, we do? What about the, the suggestions of possibly freezing eggs for the future? Is this something that we might... I, my, my own preference is that I think we should encourage our young people to interact more uh, and to get married to first. You know, because once you create options like this, A, there will be many members of society who will be wondering why we are doing this. But I think the, sim the easier, maybe not easier, but the best solution is really to get more people to uh, uh, get to know one another better. And that is why I'm very happy that we try to reduce the pressure in our school system. Uh, <laughs> Minister Ong Yi Kang has also taken a further step of reducing exams. And I hope that as parents, I think there are many parents in this room, that we don't put too much pressure on our right. kids. Because if they are so focused on exams and getting good grades. But you know what? That one is primary school and secondary school. Too young, right? I, uh -huh. I, yeah, so only we're talking about university, so maybe they should also ease up. Because I don't want my kids to be distracted in sec two, you know, and start dating, right? You know? uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> because no exams. Are like, hey. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. So, uh -huh. so maybe we can get Steve to go and talk to NUS and NTU and all our uh -huh. universities. You all just need to spend less time in class, but hang out more yeah. at the university. No, no university lecturers here, right? Never mind. And on uh, Nancy's question about autistic ch uh, children and how we can give the feedback. Well, um, you can give the feedback to uh, MCCY and our, depending on the context, if it's about school, we'll be happy to uh, bring it up to uh, MOE. There was also an earlier question about uh, autistic, autism and uh, children with uh, special needs. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. So welcome your feedback, yeah. And uh, Joachim. Good afternoon, DPM. My name is Joe Kim. I do radio here in Singapore with 987. So very much our target demo... You close your eyes, you can <laughs> understand the voice better. Yeah, you Thank you, I know. So very much is the uh, target demo for us is the youth and young here in Singapore. So part and parcel of my job, sometimes I do go online to source for content. Sometimes I do get carried away. And this one I saw on Mothership. I believe they're here this morning as well. Recently in the social media space, there was a British national who has lived here for nine years and he passed a comment calling Singapore a Disneyland for adults and saying there is very little 
to no racism here. Only for people to disagree very fiercely on social media with comments. And my second point is to add on, some popular online personalities here in Singapore, they use the online platforms to express themselves. They do create videos based around racism here in Singapore, and these videos are so accessible to the young. I personal, personally believe that we try our best to live in a multiracial society, but why do you think this is the inner angry sentiment of many people behind their keyboards or online cameras, and what can be done to quell this sentiment for the future? Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll come to the middle, sir and white. Sure. Thank you, uh, PPM. Now, um, I'd like to thank you first uh, for selecting our company to be listed on the Future Economy website. Uh, I'm a founder of a live tree biotech. So I think the key thing I'd like to highlight here um, is that looking into the future, and I think with you and your 4G leadership, we are forming the foundation for SG100. Mm. Are we able to look from the macro point of view, or could you highlight, outline for us to prepare ourselves um, to be ready for this future economy? Because I think Singapore has various constraints, and as an ex-regular before, uh, airlock, landlock, and sea lock. We definitely need to overcome some of this uh, limitation so that we are not building a Singapore for the Singaporeans alone, but also to reach out to the international community to ensure our survivability. And I think with some of the audiences just now, we mentioned about whether we are still as competitive as we should be. I think right now, if the crisis is not here in Singapore, we probably will not face that kind of uh, pressure competition. So that will lead on to the micro point, which um, I ask for your uh, viewpoints as well. Can the next leadership you know, uh, group allow Singapore to also step into some uncomfortable zone, mm -hmm. mini crisis to manage, so that we Singaporeans, as a younger group of Singaporeans, can all come together to prepare ourselves? Because I think a lot of uh, nation has you know, sort of uh, categorized us as a nanny state, which I disagree. All right, because all our guys have to serve the military. But I guess it's because we have not faced real crisis for a long time due to the success of the government and the mm -hmm. governance. So I think with this micro uh, crisis, the people-to-people -people relationship and the people-to-government can all come together. So maybe that would also allow us to forge that sense of resilience and spirit of mm -hmm. entrepreneurship. Okay. All right, thank so, you. Yeah. And the third thing is also that uh, from the founders group you know, on the ground, uh, a lot of uh, the younger startup founders are saying that we do not have a voice yet to share with the government in some occasions because, um, you know, for example, the, the policies and the programs is improving. I think we all see that. But there could be still some areas that we need to improve in order for us to step up to the game where some of our competitors, for example, in Europe, in the US, are having. So uh, if we can have a think tank, to be able to feedback to you directly. I think that will also be something uh, for the younger group of uh, startup founders to share with you. So, okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, DPM, why don't we just take these two questions first? Yeah. Okay, so first on uh, the question about the, the social media and... Angry young people. Angry young people. Well, yeah. may not be young, I don't know, right? Talking about racism and all that. The, I would say that uh, it's, it's interesting, right, that someone who is who live here thinks that this is like Disneyland and... There's no racism. Someone feels otherwise. And I'll say that uh, on the whole, uh, the, the surveys that we have seen, the surveys that have been done, shows that, in fact, there is not, uh, you know, the racism, there's not a lot of racism in Singapore. But it also, but if you ask, is it the case that there's 100% there's no racism, I would say it would be very hard for us to guarantee that there isn't. And what is important is that we deal with it as and when it uh, arises. But more importantly, to take a more proactive step to keep emphasizing the value of our multiracial, multi religious, uh, multicultural uh, um, setting. In fact, last night, um, SM uh, Teochi Hien uh, and I were at the event for the uh, Hare Raya uh, dinner you know, with uh, Minister Masagos. And it was a wonderful event. I, I met many members of the interreligious organizations, and it was, it was a very multiracial uh, event. The two weeks back, two, three weeks back, I was in uh, Gelang Sarai with uh, SMS Maliki. And it was such a vibrant place, both a traditional Hari Raya Bazaar 
as well as a new section with plenty of hipster cafe. So for the first time, I understood what a hipster cafe was about. But what was most interesting was, for me was to see so many young people you know, having a good time together, eating, and so many new and interesting uh, halal food uh, being sold. And everyone was having a good time. So I think by specific activities like this, we can make a difference. Now, on, the, uh, on, the, on your point about the videos, again, I don't know whether uh, this is one, one thing that online media is something that we have to guard uh, very carefully. Because is it a real event that really happened? Uh, is it one in, in 10,000, but somebody put it up and suddenly became the norm that, well, there must be a lot of racism because so-and-so -and -so uttered this word or so-and-so did this or that. I think that would be, we have to be very careful. The same point that Carol was making about digital literacy. Now, on the question about companies, well, I'm happy that uh, your company is listed on our FEC website. Um, what about, what happens to the future Singapore economy, you know, when Singapore is celebrating SG100. Do we have a, a place in, in the world? I would say yes. I, I'm optimistic because there are many factors that are plus for us. One is really the fact that our people are so much better educated, technologically savvy. Our strategic location in this part of Asia, and if you look at all the projections of economic growth in the future, the Asian region is likely to continue to, to grow, you know, with China, with India, with uh, ASEAN. Some of the largest economies in the world are going to be here. But that doesn't mean that Singapore will grow. We'll have to seize the opportunities, and that's why I mentioned that we must be cognizant of our challenges, look at where we can have the advantage, build up our capability in being able to do business across the region, build up our capability to use technology, innovation, and build up our entrepreneurial spirit. And if I may add, part of the entrepreneurial spirit is this resilient spirit. Because nothing, nothing can succeed at the first try. Right? Very, few people, very few things can succeed at the, on the first try. But it means trying and trying again and building that resilience. And I, when I look at the scene today, compared to when I was last in the Ministry of Trade Industry almost 20 years ago, uh, it has really become a lot more vibrant. On the point about the founder's feedback, I'll be happy to uh, get someone to get in touch with you to uh, hear your views about what can we do to improve our business environment for, for startups. And not just for startups, I'll say that even for scale up. Because starting up something is one thing. Uh, having 10 customers is very different from it when you're having 1,000 customers. And how do we help companies along this journey of uh, scaling up and making a success? So something which I'll be happy to talk. And lastly, yeah. he suggested this idea of allowing, allowing certain crises and uh, challenges to, ah. you know, so that we can learn from it. Well, so I, I would say that I'm, I don't think uh, we, we can be in the business of manufacturing crisis, but I do want to caution that, you know, crises will come. Uh, when I was running the Monetary Authority of Singapore, the first two years, I was going to all the central bank meetings and everyone was talking about how, the stable, how stable the world was, how we have kept inflation low and growth was high, not knowing that a bubble was building up in the housing market in the US. And so we have the CDO, Debaker, and a major global financial crisis. So I'll say that never say never, and that we must be prepared. Yeah, will there be another crisis? Well, we don't know, uh, because, but we must be prepared for it. Uh, this trade tensions between the US and China is not going to be uh, a short-term matter. It's going to be with us for many years to come. And in fact, financial markets are quite nervous about this. So I hope that there will be a, a good resolution to this. But on the other hand, I think we must have our guts up even in looking at this. And that is why in Singapore, it's very important for all of us uh, to look outwards look outwards and see what are the major forces around us that could reshape us in very significant ways. Okay, our last two questions. I'll start from the right lady in purple. Um, good morning, uh -huh. um, Again, thank you very much for uh, inviting 
us to this uh, dialogue session today. So I felt that I need to speak on behalf of the senior population, given the fact that we are actually an aging population. Uh -huh. So uh, my name is Siu Chin. I'm from a charity with IPC status uh, called Blossom Seeds, um, with the plans to plant seeds for everyone to blossom, including oh. the seniors. Yeah. So basically for us, we have two parts to our program, our home-based program. We bring seniors for medical appointments uh, every, every day. So the seniors that we saw, uh, a lot of them have, have critical conditions, chronic conditions, and then their life is all about visiting the hospitals and then nothing else. So for us, what we do on top of that is we try to bring them out for uh, events and other discussions at the, so that their life is not just about medical appointments. And on the second part, we, have our, we just moved into our first centre at uh, Sam, Sakamba Sampawang. And, uh, and over there, we noticed that there's a lot of seniors with uh, caregivers of dementia, uh, patients, Parkinson's, uh, spouse, and all that. So at our centre, and uh, some of them, they have chronic conditions as well, and they have not been working for a while. And over there at our centre, we try to engage them by giving them a platform to contribute. So we made them to become our centre befrienders to look after okay, other so seniors. Sorry, so sorry, so sorry. What, what, what is your question? So we... So the, question, so the question I have is twofold. So the first question I had is, how can the care for senior be less clinical? So like my medical trip is funded, but anything else that I do other than that is not funded, you know, for example. But we felt that it was important. So we carry on doing all that, to that so that the seniors have a more holistic care. And the second part to my question is, I benefited from... Uh, working with the sick and dying at a very young age of 20. And, I, and it took me 10, 20 years to prepare my parents for their old age and for their dying. So my question is, uh, how, do, how can Singapore better plan for our next wave of seniors? You see, not just myself, but even like, how can we be better prepared for aging? Because I realized that this generation, a lot of the seniors that we are working, that we saw, they were not prepared for their aging issues. You know, be, be physical, mental, emotional issues. So a lot of them had a lot of bag baggage. But how can we better prepare our young people now for their aging in the future? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And your question, please. Good afternoon, DPM. My name is Deborah Koch, and I'm 17, currently studying at Singapore American Sorry, can you speak <laughs> closer, closer to the mic? We okay. can't really hear you. Um, hi, my name is Deborah Koch, and I'm currently 17, studying at Singapore American School. I'm the president of United Singapore, which helps to promote local foreign integration among youth, and I'm also a onepeople.sg youth advocate. And my question is regarding the youth in Singapore. Youth can be very passionate about certain causes, and I wanted to ask, how can we... Um, further encourage youths in Singapore to take initiative or even start initiatives in order to help address their concerns. Thank you. Okay. Thank in order you. to, sorry? To, to uh, address their initiatives, their concerns and... Uh, yeah. Okay. So first on, on Siu Chin's uh, question, uh, let, let me thank you for doing this very meaningful work and taking care of the elderly you know, for so many years. You started when you were very young. And your, your question is actually a very critical one because, you see, our... Our seniors, the, the number of people who are above 65 and above, will increase from about 450,000 today to 900,000 by 2030. And 2030 is just 11 years away. So this, we are going to be one of the most rapidly aging uh, societies in the world. I, and uh, I know Minister Gan Kimio has spent a lot of time looking at what we can do uh, across different settings, from healthcare to family care, and uh, he's looking at, uh, looking at the whole transformation of our healthcare system. What can be done for us to provide better care? And at the same time, uh, Minister uh, Josephine is working on uh, the idea of a productive longevity. Uh, a few months back, I went to Japan to study what they were doing because Japan has one of the highest aging uh, rates in the world. And what Japan has done is, for instance, in the area of uh, work, they have found that people who want to work, people who work, stay healthy because there's something to look forward to every day. There's a whole circle of friends and colleagues that they can continue to interact with. It's not such a sharp a change of lifestyle. So uh, we are looking at what can be done for us to think about retirement, retirement age, and keeping our people uh, healthy and active, even as, as they grow older. We started this uh, project on a community network for seniors. I mentioned uh, in my speech earlier that uh, Kim Yong will be continuing to drive this. And this is 
80% of our population lives in HDB flats, and at the Void Decks, they can come together to uh, participate in the whole range of activities among neighbours. And that is very easy, simple, and accessible to everyone. So we have to continue to look at some of these measures that we need to take, and uh, it will be one of the areas that we are going to discuss with uh, Singaporeans and with all the organisations, VWOs, hospitals, and so on, who are involved, on how can we achieve this target of you know, this goal of productive longevity, and that the work is not just about looking after healthcare, uh, looking at hospitals. On your specific suggestions on the medical subsidies, I will ask uh, Minister Gan to have a look at it. Yeah. But what then, about, because very often we are promoting active ageing, but now she's saying, how do we prepare them also for what is the possible outcome, you know, right. death and, and growing old? Yeah. So that's another part of the work indeed. That, you know, it is one of those events that we can, uh, none of us can, can escape from. So looking at uh, how can we uh, allow and enable individuals uh, to pass on uh, peacefully. Uh, and uh, it's something which we must continue to look at. I've spoken to some of uh, the volunteers in our hospices, for instance, and uh, they shared also important lessons of what we can uh, do uh, for individuals. So it's something that we must continue to talk about. Then on the last question by Deborah from uh, on about youth. youth, what can they do on issues close to their hearts? Well, first, uh, I'm very happy that you're doing this uh, integration. I think it's important for all our young people to get comfortable with one another around the world. And uh, I want to thank you for that work. On what are the causes? Well, uh, youths can take part. Uh, MCCY has a very active uh, youth uh, section and that they, you can uh, join them to do some of this work. I, I also happen to chair this uh, National Youth uh, Achievement Awards, uh, which is a scheme that we started many years ago, encouraging our young people to develop themselves, to learn skills, and to also uh, provide service learning. Many of them have gone on to continue to volunteer to do all sorts of interesting work. And I meet them from time to time. It's been a very good group. So we will ask our MCCY colleagues to get in touch with you to see what more we can do. Together with youth groups all over, uh, in the People's Association, in MCCY, in, uh, uh, in our universities, polytechnics and ITE. But I think there's no limit nowadays. For our young people, I mean, the, 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 the world is really your oyster. So I think if you have an idea you want to generate it, you just find, need to find people to help you with that idea. And the government, I, from my point of view, the way I see it is to, there yes. to support you if the cause is you know, for the benefit of the country as a whole. No, right? Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. So that is what we're all here for. And I think thank you all for, for sitting, bearing through. I know we have many questions. I'm sure you have many more, but we couldn't address them today. I'm just going to let uh, DPM, any, any last words you want to just help us wrap up this session? Any last words you want to share with our audience? Well, uh, first, uh, let, let me thank all of you for being here this morning. And uh, also, I know many, many of you, in fact, almost all of you are involved in one way or another in really contributing to Singapore. So I want to encourage you uh, to continue with this effort. In fact, from all the questions that I hear this morning, uh, I really see so much effort has gone on. So thank you very much for, for this. I mentioned about two um, major areas of work we are working on that we are, I hope that we can uh, uh, start, and, or rather to continue and take it to a higher level. One is, the, as part of this Singapore Together movement, the first is how the, uh, we can come together to take action. You know, so beyond uh, just dialogue, that each of us can take action to make life better for people around us. Whatever may be the cause that you believe in, as long as it's good for Singapore, we'll be very happy to partner you in this effort. And second, uh, beyond just uh, doing the immediate issues, I mean, there are many which we need to do, but also thinking harder about Singapore. I got many good questions about what is Singapore like you know, in, when we reach SG100? How will our economy look like? How will our society look like? And in the coming uh, months, my colleagues and I will be continuing this discussion with you on the various items. Uh, and I look forward to your suggestions and views and your thoughts about how we can continue to make uh, Singapore a vibrant, lively place, you know, full of opportunities for our people, but stay resilient, caring, gracious, 
and kind. So thank you very much. Thank you, DPM. Thank you.